Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all this craziness you and I were able to find each other on this cute little earthly rotation. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the case of Timothy Wiltsey. He was a five-year-old boy who was tragically murdered in 1991, and even though police were pretty sure they knew who did it, uh, the case went unsolved for nearly 25 years before it was finally solved, or an arrest was finally made, and a conviction was finally obtained against the murderer, Timmy's own mother. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new Morbid Makeup video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you. I would love it if you would come hang out and join us and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. So now that we're done with that pesky but totally necessary self-promotion, we can get into talking about this case. And this is a case that was actually recommended to me by my sister slash subscriber. It's my sister, but she subscribed to my channel. And she texted me and told me that I should look into this case. And up until very recently, this is a case that I would not have been especially drawn to um, when it comes to true crime. And you would know this if you saw my Q&A, which if you haven't, you should watch that. It gives you a lot of insight into me if you're curious. But Two types of cases that I do not like to cover are one, unsolved cases, and two, cases involving children. So with, you know, the combination of two things that I'm not, like, particularly drawn to, it was something that I didn't think I, I would cover. But recently, like very recently, after 25 years, 25 years, dude, this case was finally solved. And it's so, so sad because it turns out that the person who took Timmy from this world all those years ago was his own mother. And honestly, this case is so wild. When I started to look into it, I was like, there's just so many twists and turns from this woman, Michelle, his mother's name is Michelle. She, all of her ever changing stories of what actually happened to Timmy to her faking her own kidnapping. Like it's, there's a lot that this woman did and a lot to unpack here. And I think we should just get into it. So come gather around and let me tell you the tragic story of the murder of five-year-old Timothy Wiltsey at the hands of his own mother. Timothy William Wiltsey, known affectionately by his nickname Timmy, was born on August 6, 1985, making him a Leo, and he was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Timmy was born to young parents. His mother, Michelle Lodzinski, was only 17 when she gave birth to her son Timmy, and his father George was a teenager as well, George Wiltsey. That's where he got the last name Wiltsey, obviously. And when the two met, George and Michelle, Michelle was only 14 years old, so it was a very, very young romance. He was from Iowa and she was from New Jersey, but each summer she would come out and visit her brother who lived in Iowa, who owned a home that was just down the street from George's house. So the two would always have a little summer romance. Every time she would come to visit, they would meet up and the relationship lasted several years um, long distance. Long distance is hard for any couple, and especially when you're that young, because everything is more intense. But the two did everything they could to make their young love work, with her coming and visiting him in Iowa each summer, and then he would come to New Jersey and stay with Michelle and her family. At one point, he even came and stayed for an entire month. And after that month-long trip, George actually moved to Long Island. So he left Iowa and moved to Long Island. It was while George was living in Long Island with his uncle that he learned that while he had been staying with Michelle and her family for that month, he had gotten Michelle pregnant. So they were like, okay, we got to really think about how to be responsible here. And after considering all of their options, George thought the best thing for them to do would be to move together back to Iowa to start their family. For a small time when Michelle was pregnant, she did move to Iowa with George. She wanted to live with him and to try to raise their family together. She didn't really want to move to Iowa. She was really happy with her family in New Jersey, but George and her talked and he convinced her that this was the best place for them to start their family together. It was a small town, it had a very small town safe feel, and it also had good hospitals for her to give birth in. And plus the two, though young, were so in love with each other. They were obsessed with each other and couldn't get enough of each other. So they moved together to Iowa to start their family. And once there, they welcomed their first ever baby, their only baby that they'd have together, little Timmy. It didn't take long, however, for Michelle to realize that her life was her life with George wasn't really what she wanted. She didn't like Iowa. She did not like the small town feel. She missed New Jersey and she missed her friends and her family and having things to do. And 
Honestly, she was probably a little bit lonely because she was a new mother, which is already a big thing when you're a teenager. She had moved to this place where she didn't know anybody. She didn't have a lot of friends or family. Like, her brother lived in, in Iowa and stuff, but it just... It, I feel like motherhood is very isolating already without, you know, the added giant move and lack of that safety net, community net. And George was always gone at work. He was the sole breadwinner. Babies aren't cheap. And I think that that was just very lonely for her. And in addition to that, George has said himself that towards the end, the couple did fight a lot. And at least on one occasion, it did get physical. So it sounds like it just wasn't the move, you know? So suffice it to say, it just really wasn't what she wanted. And when Timmy was just six months old, Michelle and he were picked up by a family member and moved back to New Jersey. And the relationship between her and George effectively ended. In the romantic relationship ending between George and Michelle, so did George's relationship with his young son, Timmy. And why this... Um, dissolve happened between the father and the son is up for debate and it depends on who you ask. According to George himself, he wanted to have a relationship with Timmy. He loved Timmy, but Michelle told him she wanted nothing to do with him and wanted Timmy to have nothing to do with him. He says that he sent cards or, you know, toys, stuff on the birthday, and she would just send it back. I, you know, it's one of those things for me, and maybe this is just like the woman in me, if the rules were reversed, I would do anything I could to see my kid. I'm not going to let some person say, like, I don't want you involved. I'd be like, well, that sucks for you because I'm going to be. But what we do know is when Michelle left with Timmy, when Timmy was six months old, that is the last time that George ever saw his son. So now we're going to hop in our handy dandy time machine and we're going to head to 1991 in South Amboy, which is a small town in New Jersey, the lower than usual crime rate when compared to the other cities in the area. So it's just like a nice, safe, wholesome place to start a family, raise kids and live. Michelle, now 23, is still a single mother raising her one child, Timmy, who at this time is five years old. And Michelle is working as a secretary to make ends meet. Timmy is attending kindergarten at this time at the St. Mary Elementary School, and he is just known as being like a sweet boy, a shy boy with just an adorable smile and a head of light brown hair just like his mother. He was just a sweet kid who loved animals. He had a pet cat that he slept with each night, and he had this weird little habit of sleeping with his shoes on. He loved ice cream and fire trucks and Ninja Turtles. He was just like a little five-year-old baby boy, dude, just a little boy. During the Memorial Day weekend on May 25th, 1991, a call came into police that there was a missing little boy. It was a cool night in late spring, and the boy had gone missing from a carnival that was hosted by the South Amboy Elks Club at the John F. Kennedy Park in Sayreville, New Jersey. <sighs> An officer arrived and he approached a seemingly frantic and hysterical Michelle. She told officers then that at approximately 7.30, she had been in a line for a ride with Timmy and had wanted to go buy herself a soda. So she left her five-year-old son at the ride and went to buy a soda. And when she came back, he was just gone. So police are like, okay, he's probably like a missing kid at a carnival. He's probably just hiding somewhere. So they shut the carnival down and they search it extensively. And at first they're just, you know, looking in nooks, looking in crannies, like trying to find where he's hiding. And then they're starting to realize, okay, this is a little more serious. So they start like really searching. They bring in dogs, helicopters. They're searching like the ponds around the park. They're looking everywhere for him. During the search, they brought in canines, like scent dogs, to try to locate Timmy's smell, but Michelle didn't have anything on her that belonged to Timmy and would have his scent. So a volunteer firefighter who was there during the search offered to drive her home to go pick something up of Timmy's so the scent dogs could try to find him. So they go, okay, and they drive to the house and she picks something up of Timmy's and then on their way back, you would think she'd want to hurry, right? You'd think she'd want to get back immediately to where her son had just disappeared from, but no. On her way back, she's like, okay, can we please stop in at this bar because my boyfriend works there, my ex-boyfriend actually, it wasn't even her boyfriend at the time, and I wanna go tell him so he can come help us search. So, this man drives over to this bar and she goes in by herself and she's in there for 15 minutes, dude. 15 minutes before she comes back out alone. 
And this guy doesn't even come back with her to search for Timmy. Anyways, they go back to the park, they conduct the search, and they, they don't find him anywhere. And finally, the search is exhausted at about 1 a.m., so an officer drives Michelle home, and when she gets there, her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend is just sitting on the stoop waiting for her, waiting to help her and console her in this time. And Timmy was just gone. This five-year-old boy is just missing, completely gone without a trace, a week before his kindergarten graduation. The following day, bright and early, the searches continue with many, just so many people showing up to try to help find Timmy. And people who were there at the searches reported that Michelle just didn't seem the way, she didn't seem to act the way a woman, a mother, who was missing her five-year-old child would act. She seemed disconnected and disinterested, and I know everybody responds to trauma in different ways. And when she was, you know, challenged on her actions, she said, I don't show emotions in public, and I don't think I should have to because someone wants me to. Which is fair, but if this was like the one thing that made her look sketchy, then maybe it could be forgiven. But trust me when I say, this is not the one thing that's going to make her look sketchy. As the days continued, people were searching for Timmy everywhere. This case was extremely publicized. There were searches just conducted everywhere, like thousands of missing persons flyers were passed out, and everyone was on the lookout for Timmy. The flyer described him as five years old, standing at only three feet tall and weighing 45 pounds, and that he went missing wearing a red tank top, red shorts, and little Ninja Turtle sneakers. And man, the little, I don't know what it is about hearing little Ninja Turtle sneakers, but it like kills my heart. Because it, it's a little baby boy, you know? I don't know. Look at this is why I don't do kids. <laughs> no. No. This case was so highly publicized and so highly known at the time. It was featured on America's Most Wanted. Milk cartons were like just covered with Timmy's smiling face. Like, I don't feel like I can stress enough just how big this case was and how, like, publicized it was. Everyone was looking for this kid. Everyone knew he was missing. And it's especially sad when you see sometimes how other missing persons cases are handled. Every case should be handled the way this case was handled because the community should just always band together like this when a person goes missing. Because, because I mean, I read that like 25,000 railroad, railway workers, you know, trains going from state to state in 13 different states all received a copy of Timmy's um, missing persons flyer. I believe it was with their paychecks. And Timmy's face was like on the big screen at Yankee Stadium. Like they wanted to find this kid. Everyone wanted to find this kid. And he was just gone. So with the publicity and the media on this case, police like really cracked down. They took it extremely seriously and they immediately started trying to look into suspects and, and eliminate suspects. And of course, one of the very first places they went was to George Wiltsey, Timmy's father, because that's like the first logical step. See if maybe there was some sort of custody issue. Maybe he did want Timmy and just went and took him. But when they went and spoke to him, they found that his, his alibi was airtight. He was nowhere near New Jersey on the night that Timmy disappeared. And it's just so sad for this guy, dude, because he learned about his son being missing the following day when police came to question him. Michelle didn't even bother to call him and tell him. And I feel like that's really sad. I get it. You don't have a good relationship. You don't talk. But in this sort of situation, like, I think it's kind of your job to call your ex. No? But then again, this is the woman who ended up being found responsible. So her moral compass isn't due north. They also looked into Michelle's on again, off again boyfriend, the one that she went and saw at the bar that night. His name was Fred, but it, found, it was found that he had a strong alibi as well as he was working at that bar that night and never even came to help in the searches. In investigating the case and looking into Michelle's story of what happened that night, it was quickly found that her story didn't quite add up and it was starting to crumble. Police started invest, um, questioning people who were at the carnival and it turned out there was no proof that Timmy was ever even at the carnival. No one there remembered seeing Timmy and one woman even remembered being at the carnival and talking to Michelle's talking and standing for like talking for a prolonged period of time and Timmy wasn't there and Michelle wasn't stressed about Timmy. She didn't seem like he was missing or she was distressed. She was just casually talking with no child with her. Police then went through video footage and camera footage and pictures that people had taken at the carnival and Timmy showed up nowhere. 
So police start to question witnesses, and they realize that the last time anyone other than Michelle had actually seen Timmy was at 1 p.m. that afternoon. So police are like, okay, we need to start looking into the hours of 1 p.m. when Timmy was last seen by anyone but his mother, and 7 p.m. when Michelle said she and Timmy arrived at the carnival. Police questioned Michelle to just kind of, you know, find out what the two did that day. And she said that she and Timmy had gone to a park in Holmdale. They had parked their car in a parking lot and had gone over to play and see the animals. And after that, they had headed over to the carnival. But when police looked into this to corroborate her story, they found that the specific parking lot that she said that her and Timmy had parked in was actually closed that day. So there's no way she could have parked there. And of course, maybe she was just confused about which lot she had parked in. She's a human, human error is a thing. But when you combine that with the rest of her crumbling story, it just starts not looking good for Michelle and it only starts to look worse for her from there. The energy and opinion just started to shift around Michelle. Her story wasn't making sense. She had like a super weird sort of casual attitude about the fact that her only child, a tiny little five-year-old is missing. She didn't seem super anxious to like spread the word or conduct searches. She was just disconnected altogether when it came to Timmy's disappearance. And because of this, investigators started to look at her more thoroughly. They gave her polygraph tests, which she failed. And when they started to push her, her story started to change. Less than a month after Timmy had gone missing, the police called her in to question her again on her story, and she had completely changed her story. Where before she had said that, you know, she had been waiting in line with Timmy and had wanted to go get a soda, and when she came back, he was just gone. Now she was saying that, that she had left Timmy in line to go get a soda, but when she came back, there was a man taking Timmy off of the ride. She then said that when she approached this man, he held a knife to Timmy and said that if she came any closer or screamed or brought any attention to them, he was going to kill Timmy. She says that then he met up, like he was met by another man, and the two ran off into the night with Timmy in their little arms, right? And when police tried to push her on this and like question her further, like, what are you talking about? This is totally different. She got mad, she got defensive, and she left the interview. So that's weird, right? So for the last several weeks, you've known about this abductor and just kept that information from the police, even though it could have helped you find your son faster, right? Like, that's weird. That's a weird thing to say. It's a weird thing to do. But uh, it's going to get even weirder. You just wait. She returned to the police station the following day. And she said, you know, forget that story I told you yesterday. That was a lie. That never happened. I don't know, I don't know why I did it. Forget, forget that pesky kidnapping business with that guy. I've got, I'll tell you what really happened. Now she's saying that while she was at the carnival, she ran into a woman that she knew from a previous job, a woman named Ellen. Ellen was at the carnival with two men and her young daughter when Michelle was like, man, I really want a soda. And Ellen's like, go get your soda, girl. I will watch Timmy for you. No big deal. She then said that as she went to go walk away, one of the men that was with Ellen pulled out a pocket knife and held it to Timmy and threatened to kill Timmy if she reacted. So she never made it to the soda stand. The guy pulled a pocket knife, threatened to kill Timmy. And then they all, the two men, Ellen, the little girl, and Timmy all ran off into the night. What? What is that? What even is that story? How is that one better than the last one you told? I don't understand. And if that's already not bad enough for you, like those two stories, apparently she told her ex-boyfriend Fred yet another story about what happened that night. She told Fred that she had been at the carnival and she had run into her friend Ellen, who was just there with her young daughter. So there's no two men in this story. And that Ellen was like, oh crap, I ran out of money and I want a soda. So they all walked to Ellen's car. Why did Michelle and Timmy go? I don't know. They're all friends. They all walked to Ellen's car. And when they get to Ellen's car, Ellen pulled a knife on Timmy and grabbed Timmy and pulled Timmy into her car and then took off into the night with Timmy. <sighs> so with all of that, she looks really bad, right? And police really, really suspect her, but there's no evidence to tie her to any crime. Timmy's body hasn't been found. He is just missing. He is just gone. The case goes cold. There's no new tips. There's no new searches. And it stays cold for a couple of months. Five months after Timmy went missing in October of 1991, there is finally a break in the case. A man named Dan O'Malley was exploring the marshlands area of the Raritan Center Business Park when he found something he did not expect to find. It was a child-size Ninja Turtle sneaker that was just laying in the 
wooded, leaf-covered grounds. And as you may recall on the missing persons flyer, the last thing that Timmy was reported as having been wearing included little Ninja Turtle sneakers. And this guy, since this case was so heavily publicized, remembered that and was like, oh crap. So he scooped up the shoe, it was just one shoe, and he went straight to the police station with it. The shoe was tested for DNA, but there was no evidence to suggest that it had belonged to Timmy. And when it was shown to his mother, Michelle, Michelle said this shoe did not belong to her son. So with no evidence and Michelle saying like, it doesn't belong to my son, it was stored in an evidence locker where it wasn't touched again for months. And this area where the shoe was found was never even searched. And honestly, that part makes no sense to me, especially since at this point, police are already suspecting that like Michelle had something to do with it. You would think they wouldn't just take her word for it, but it fell through the cracks somehow and this place was not searched, which makes me so mad. So months went by and that man, Dan O'Malley, who had found the shoe was like, this is so weird. They never contacted me to let me know the outcome. They never even like asked me where I found it or had me show them anything. And so he couldn't get it out of his mind because he was certain that this was related in some in some way. So he did what I think was actually a pretty smart idea. And he contacted the media and this got the ball rolling because this case was so high profile and people were so interested in it. So when he goes to the media and he's like, I found this shoe here and police didn't search people ate, ate that shit up. So it was front page news and this definitely got the police's attention. And shortly after the, uh, the story was, put on the front page of the newspapers, uh, an FBI agent immediately contacted Dan O'Malley and was like, okay, come show me where you found this shoe. And I just still can't believe that this place wasn't searched immediately. To me, it sounds like they only even did the search as damage control because they're like, we can't look like we're not looking at this point, but that's just my opinion. So finding this shoe breathed new life into this case. The energy and the momentum of the officers involved was reestablished and they were feeling motivated again to start looking further into the case. So they started to re-interview family members and friends and they asked him about the shoe, even though Michelle said it didn't belong to him. And they also asked people about the location where the shoe had been found. The Raritan Center Park, right? So they ask people about this and they start to get some very interesting information from friends and family of Michelle and Timmy. Police find that Michelle had previously worked at the Raritan Center complex. And this was super odd for them to learn because when she was previously questioned when Timmy first disappeared, they asked for her full employment history and she had omitted this little workplace from her history. And that in combination with the discovery of a shoe that was Timmy's size and description of the one he had been wearing, police were starting to feel like they were right in suspecting that Michelle was involved and that they really, really needed to search the Raritan Center Park because there was a good chance at this point they weren't looking for a little boy, but looking for a body. So the search was arranged and the search of the Raritan Center grounds was conducted in April of 1992 and it didn't take them long to locate a second Ninja Turtle sneaker. It was really, really close to where the first one had been found. Close by, they also found a large blue and white blanket and some of the articles of Timmy's clothing he had been wearing that day. And I'm sure at this point, police are just like, they have to be dreading looking further because on one hand, obviously you want to find this boy, but on the other hand, you know that what you're looking for is the, the dead, the dead body of a five-year-old baby. And I cannot imagine what, what it's like to know that's what you're looking for and then to find that. But it didn't take long for that dark thought cloud in the back of their head to become a reality when they discovered a small skull and the partial skeletal remains of a small child in the Red Root Creek on the grounds of the Raritan Center complex. Through dental records, it was found the skeletal remains that had been partially submerged in the creek were that of Timothy Wiltsey and just a, just a year shy of him disappearing, he was found and he was dead. Timmy's death was ruled a homicide because it was clear that he didn't, you know, wrap himself in this blanket and take himself out to this random large plot of land and just lay down and die. But what's so frustrating is because he had been out there so long, cold, alone, and in the elements, 
the rate of decomposition, had, like he was far too decomposed to even know what the cause of death was. Which, okay, I know there are going to be a lot of people who are bothered by this who want to know exactly what happened and want that closure and want to know the details and specifics of how he died. But I have to be totally honest here. For totally selfish reasons in making this video, I'm kind of glad that it's not out there because I, I got to be real here. I don't want to read the details of how a five-year-old boy was murdered. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to read that. I don't want to know that, but I do understand that some people do and what, and that it's so frustrating that we can't know exactly what happened to Timmy. When Michelle was informed that her son had been found, she did not react. She didn't ask police any questions. She didn't ask where he was found, how he died, how long he had been dead, nothing. She, she didn't ask anything. Young Timmy was laid to rest on May 12, 1991, and at the funeral, attendees noted that Michelle, again, did not act like a mother who had just lost her son, who was burying her five-year-old baby. She was calm, she was cool, and even a bit disinterested. Though police suspected Michelle, because honestly, at this point, how could you not, with all the circumstantial evidence against her and the ever-changing stories, but since there was no real evidence against her, no real evidence to arrest her, the case went cold. Timmy had been found. His story wasn't circulating around the media anymore because, you know, once, once a kid's found, it's no longer newsworthy at this point. And the case just went cold and eventually Michelle actually ended up moving. She didn't go far. She only went 10 minutes away. She just wanted to get out of the house where this had happened and where the media had hounded her previously. She just wanted to move away where people didn't know her and know what she was suspected of, in my opinion. Over a year after Timmy's body had been found, Timmy's name wasn't in the media anymore, but Michelle's name ended up back in the media. And this happened because one day, Michelle's car was found parked outside of her brother's apartment with the engine running, the doors locked, and her nowhere to be seen. Nowhere to be found. Michelle's missing. Her brother's the one who found the car, and when he found it in that condition, he realized that something must be wrong. So he called the police, and when police were called, they started looking into it, and it was found that Michelle was supposed to be at work that day, but had never shown up, so Michelle was reported as a missing person. And of course, you know, this was big news because it was the mother of a murdered child, and the murderer still hadn't been found, and now she was missing under suspicious circumstances, and the media just eats shit like that up. It didn't take long for Michelle to be discovered, however. <laughs> Michelle was found the very next day in Detroit, Michigan, and when she was questioned about what happened to her, she said that two police officers, I believe she said they were FBI agents, had kidnapped her, had driven her to Detroit, and dropped her off there and said that this is what she got for talking about Timmy. Um, this is super weird, right? They they kidnap her, they tell her, you know, keep your mouth shut about your missing son. But at this point, she's not talking about Timmy anymore. Timmy's out of the news. She's moved away to a place where her neighbors don't even know who she is, don't even know that she's the mother of a murdered child. Like, this is a point where she's no longer in, important to people. She's not in the media. So why all of a sudden would these random FBI agents just now decide, like, she needs to keep her mouth shut? So in doubting her story, because it doesn't make any sense, police start questioning her further and she can't prove that any of this happened. And this silly, silly bitch <laughs> ends up getting arrested for faking her own kidnapping when it is discovered that there's evidence that she bought herself a bus ticket and went to Detroit and made it all up. She made it all up. She made it all up. I also read that this woman went as far as to have fake business cards for fake FBI agents made to make her story seem more plausible, which like, who does that? Who actually does that? Michelle does. It's, it's crazy to me, but she didn't get away with it. She ended up being arrested. She was given six months of house, house arrest, three years on probation and ordered to go undergo court mandated therapy, which Good, because this woman obviously has issues. It sounds like she really, really, really needs attention. Like as soon as she was out of the media and her kid had been found, she's like, I need to do something to get back in into people's eyes and people's hearts and people's minds. And to then go on and say that all of this happened because of your dead son, like using your dead child to make your story more interesting makes me just so mad. It makes, fuck, 
write the fuck off, Michelle. Unless, of course, everybody is wrong and you're innocent and you're just um, suffering, then like, I'm sorry, but I really doubt that that's true, so... Over the years, Timmy's case remained unsolved and Michelle just moved on with her life. She ended up having two more children. She moved to Minnesota and then to Florida. She got married to a man named Harold. And I believe Harold is only the father of one of these two children. But, you know, that marriage didn't last. And while Michelle was pregnant with their child, she decided this relationship wasn't for her and she up and moved back to Florida. Sound familiar? She lived a quiet and unassuming life. She just seemed like the average mother, suburban mom living in a like little, you know, cul-de-sac area. Her neighbors having no idea that she even had a first son, that she was the main suspect in the murder of her first child. And I assume that she, how would I, I, she probably thought she was never gonna get caught. All these years had gone by and she had just gotten away with it. I just wonder if you're ever actually able to relax when you've done something like that. Like, are you ever able to, to just like accept that you've gotten away with something and just chill? Or are you always waiting for the other shoe to drop? Because the other shoe dropped for Michelle. 23 years after Timmy was murdered on August 6th, 2014, which would have been Timmy's 29th birthday. Michelle Lodzinski, Timmy's mother, who was now in her 40s, was arrested for her son's murder as she left her job in Florida. And just a side note here, I have to wonder if that was sort of planned for police, you know, executing that warrant, the, the arrest warrant on Timmy's birthday. Part of me thinks that maybe they had it like a week before and they're like, wait a minute, we gotta wait. His birthday's coming up, the headlines, like that is the time because the drama of it all. So it turns out what ended up getting Michelle arrested is that Timmy's case was one of several cold cases that investigators had been going through and re-examining evidence. And in looking and in looking at Timmy's case, they realized that they had enough evidence, albeit circumstantial evidence, to bring Michelle to trial. Now, police apparently also had evidence that they had had the entire time that had just been sitting in evidence lockers that they didn't realize was important evidence until the cold case unit started to go over the case a second time. It was evidence that had been found at Timmy's murder scene, evidence that had never been released to the public and had therefore never been seen by friends and family members of Timmy and Michelle's, and just evidence that police didn't think was important to paint a full picture, but it turns out they were wrong. Michelle was held in a Florida jail without bond before being sent back to New Jersey to have the case heard before a jury. Of course, she pled not guilty to the murder of her son, and the trial was set for March of 2016, just shy of 25 years after Timmy's murder. Apparently, the piece of evidence that really broke this case open was the large blue and white blanket that was found near Timmy's body at his crime scene. When this was initially shown to Michelle, she said that she had never seen this blanket before in her life. But when Timmy's case was reopened and the cold case unit detectives started looking into the case, they started tracking people down to question them. And of these people, one was Timmy's cousin. And this was a cousin that used to babysit Timmy when he was alive. And when they showed her the blanket, she was visibly shaken. She said that this blanket was definitely Timmy's. It was from their house and that when she would babysit him, the two of them would snuggle up together under it when they would spend time together and watch TV, read stories, things like that. Another two witnesses ended up testifying at trial that they also recognized this blanket as belonging to the household of Michelle and Timmy. This evidence ended up being extremely damning for Michelle's case, not only because she lied and claimed to have never seen it, but several people who have no reason to lie said that they saw it in your house, right? And there is no possible way for a blanket from your home to end up with your child's dead body in the freaking creek unless he had been taken from your house. This kid's not gonna bring this giant blanket. It wasn't like a small blanket. It was like a big, like a comforter off of like a kid's bed. You're not gonna bring that to a carnival with you so that it, it didn't make sense that he was kidnapped from the carnival. It was very clear that this boy had not been kidnapped from the carnival like his mother had stated. He had been at his home when something happened to him and when his body was transported, the blanket was taken from his home as well. 
It was also brought out at trial that Michelle wasn't this loving and affectionate mother like she had wanted people to perceive her as. Um, people who worked at Timmy's elementary school said that they would see her when she would drop Timmy off or pick Timmy up from school and she was never warm or affectionate or loving like other parents were. She never gave him a hug or a kiss goodbye. She just dropped him off and left him. Michelle's attorney tried to, of course, um, give up alternative theories to what could have happened to Timmy. He tried to say that it could have been an accidental death and not a deliberate death. He also tried to put reasonable doubt and make it seem like somebody else could have done it. But all of these were kind of fruitless endeavors because all of the evidence pointed directly to his client, Michelle. Now, could it have been an accident? I mean, maybe. We don't know because she isn't talking. And and I mean, that's what ended up helping get Casey Anthony off for, for her child's death is because people couldn't believe 100% that she did it on purpose. And I was really surprised at the outcome of this case because that this case felt so eerily similar to the Casey Anthony case that I was really worried when looking into it that she would get away with this because of that reasonable doubt on whether or not it was an accidental or a, or a purposeful death. After several days of deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict. Michelle was found guilty of the murder of her five-year-old son, Timmy, and she was sentenced to 30 years in prison with no possibility of parole. The woman who had brought Timmy into this world had taken him out, and she has never admitted as to why. Timmy's father, George, has said that he's happy that she's in jail and that she was convicted for this because even though he hadn't seen his son, the fact that he was dead and that nobody had been held responsible for it weighed on him. He said that he had always believed she was involved because nobody who is innocent lies that much, which agreed. And he had said that if she was convicted, he wanted to actually have Timmy's body exhumed so that he could be moved and be buried with George and George's family and like their burial plot and burial area, but I didn't see any updates on if this ever actually happened. And he did also state that if he ended up doing this, he wanted Michelle's family to pay for this. So he doesn't have a good relationship with Michelle's family. I've read that. There's definitely tension there. I mean, they got together so young. They separated so young. They sounded like they had a pretty woof relationship. So there's just, you know, tension there. Family tension is normal. And I'm sure part of it is the fact that he wasn't involved in Timmy's life as well. Now, whether that is because he chose not to be involved or if he was told not to be involved, I don't know. There's contradicting reports on that. But I do know that George didn't come to help with any of the searches. That much I know. But again, was he told to do that or did he choose not to do that? I don't know. But I just know if it was my kid um, and he told me not to come search for my missing child, I'd be like, suck on this, you know, but that's just me. As far as theories go, there are many and will probably always be many because Michelle is not talking and admitting to what happened. One theory is that because apparently Timmy had some health issues, they were unspecified. They just said that something with his teeth and something with his stomach and that as he got older, it became more and more difficult for Michelle to deal with. That's what people who were around her during, you know, Timmy's life said. They said that as he got older, it was harder and harder for her to deal with. And they think that she just got tired of having to. It was also stated by people who were close to her around the time that Timmy disappeared that she had said, and I quote, I'm a weekend mother and I was not made for this shit. Which we'll go over that a little more during my thoughts and opinions part of this video. For a little end of the video fun fact for you, apparently during Michelle's trial, she had been being walked into the courtroom and she was all shackled up on her wrists and her ankles. And she says that police were walking her too quickly and she actually ended up falling and apparently she sustained permanent, di permanent damage to her wrist in this fall. And she ended up suing the Middlesex County Sheriff's Department and they ended up settling with her for $25,000. I wonder what she's gonna do with that. I guess in prison, $25,000 will buy you like a lot of top ramen, but no, she'll probably give it to her two children that are still alive um, or use it for her legal defense because I do know that she's trying to appeal to the Supreme Court. I don't think anything's gone through yet. And I know that she did try to appeal previously, but her appeals were denied. And I, now that I'm saying it out loud, I don't know if that was really a fun fact or if it was just like additional information, but I feel at this point in the video, some of you would like to imagine this woman fully shackled, falling straight on her face, unable to break her fall. But that, my friends, is the story of Timothy Wilsey, the five-year-old boy whose murder went unsolved for 25 years before finally getting justice when his own mother was convicted of his murder. What do you think? I think it's really screwed up, dude. I think uh, it makes me super 
pissed off and I think she was definitely involved. I agree with Timmy's father that an innocent person doesn't lie like that, especially not when your child is missing. Because all you would be doing at that point is slowing down and complicating the process of getting your child back. And if you weren't involved, that's all you would want, right? Like all you would want is your baby back if you didn't do anything to him. And you know, do I think she was alone? I don't know. I'm just not sure. I know that her boyfriend at the time was cleared and had an alibi, but I'd like to know what that alibi was. I guess the bar is the alibi, but if he was killed earlier in the day, I'd like to know what the, the alibi was for earlier in the day, because I do think that her stop into the bar, like 15 minute stop in the bar is weird. Like I could see her in a scenario where she had nothing to do with it and her child is really missing. I could see her wanting to go in there and like get him to come help her and be there for moral support, but like he didn't even come. But I can also see that we don't know what was said when she was in there. So she might have went in there and not said anything that actually made it seem like there was a sense of urgency in her that would make it so he would like, why would he come then? I don't know what I'm trying to say. If there was ever like an emergency worth leaving work for, a missing child seems like it would be it, right? But I also read that at least what he has said is that him and Michelle weren't very serious and he didn't take the relationship serious. So maybe he was kind of like, not my problem. I don't know. That's sort of a dick move. I'm not saying he was involved. I'm just saying that like, I really want to know what she said to him when she went inside. Did she downplay it? Did she make it seem serious? What was said? These are the questions I have because if she downplayed it, okay, it makes sense that he didn't come. She didn't. Why didn't he come? I just have a lot of questions there, but I don't know. I don't know what my point was there. I'm just like rambling, you know? But what I do know is I do know, I do truly 100% believe she was involved. I believe that she knows exactly what happened and I believe that she is responsible for Timmy's death. Now, do I think that the prosecution proved that she straight up murdered him? If I'm speaking from a more fact-based place and not an emotional place, maybe not. Um, to be honest, it reminds me, again, so much of the Casey Anthony case and I think that if her attorney had worked harder, um, providing reasonable doubt for it being an accidental murder, she might have had a different outcome like Casey Anthony did because cause of death was never found. And in the Casey Anthony case, there was way, way more damning evidence, in my opinion, against Casey Anthony and she still walked. So I'm super thankful that that didn't happen because I truly believe that both of those women are responsible for their kids' deaths. And I just, I really wish that Michelle would just say exactly what happened. But I doubt she will. I doubt she'll ever want her other sons, her teenage sons that are still alive to know what she did. Um, so I don't think she'll ever admit it, but only time will really tell. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope that it was interesting and informative and gave you everything you would like to know about this case. And of course, I hope it made sense. I feel like I was a little scatterbrained today. I've had like a long, long day, long night. So I hope that it made sense. And I hope that you enjoyed it. Obviously, I always want you to enjoy what I put out. I don't know if enjoy is the right word because this is like a super sad case, but y you know what I mean. Please let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover. Put them down below in the, uh, the comment section because as this video proves, if you suggest it to me, eventually I will try to get to it and make a video on it because this was a suggestion from my sister slash subscriber. And I know all of you are just filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. Of course, if you have not already, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every week and I would love to hang out with you. And if you would like to connect more, um, more often, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter. They're both Brad or Steen, like my namesake here. And I try to respond to every single person who contacts me because like, you guys are cool. And with all of that said, thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That's tight. You're tight. This is tight. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.